Well, you've met him all before, the illustrious uh, Kyle Green. I mean, Canada is in the top 25 brokers in Canada. I mean, that's quite an achievement when you look at the several thousand brokers that, that we have in the, in the business. You've been in business since 2017. I'm sure that you've seen it all, Carl. I mean, but have you seen as many changes as we seem to be getting now? I, I mean, in my career, there's been a lot of changes, obviously, since the subprime crisis and then the government trying to layer Band-Aid over Band-Aid over the real estate industry. But um, I think collectively between mortgage changes and tax changes, I don't know if I've ever seen a, a time. I mean, it, Ozzy, I should be asking you this question. You've been around for a lot longer. I mean, have you ever seen anything like this? First of all, thank you very much for pointing out that I might be old, right? <laughs> but <laughs> no, but the, the, point, the point is, you're right. I mean, it's tax a day, a new tax every day, a new rule every day. There's short-term rental crisis, flipping taxes, and all these things going on. In the meantime, the government says we cannot afford it anymore. We need more builders. We need more investors. And what does the investor and builder say? Hey, just I'm going to wait this one out. Well, now, of course, the organization or the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institution, OSFI, you know, easy for me to say, OSFI, uh, also brings out totally new mortgage rules. And one of the big ones is uh, this new loan-to-income ratio, as opposed to the loan-to-value. What exactly is an LTI? Yeah, it's, it's basically just a function of how large the loan is compared to the borrower's income. So um they're char they're targeting a 450 percent loan to um loan to income ratio what that means is effectively they want loans to be no more than about four and a half times uh, the borrower's income now this is a portfolio rule so it's not going to be uh just determined on an individual basis which is good so it doesn't mean that a borrower comes in and uh, they must adhere to these rules but in the back end it does mean that the bank is going to have to make sure that um, that their portfolio is matching these these guidelines. Um, the the good news is because interest rates have come up so much, the loan to income ratio is probably only on new business coming in the door is only about four hundred to four hundred fifty percent anyways. So, so clients can't qualify to borrow that much money in today's climate. But the reality is they're coming in with this rule to ensure that if and when interest rates do decrease. That they're not going to see a ton of people borrow too much money that they can't afford. And then if rates come back up again, then we're going to be in a position where a lot of people overall can't afford their mortgages. It's still confusing to me. So what you're saying is I earn $100,000, I can borrow $450,000. Yeah. But not, I could all borrow more if the portfolio of the bank is different. No, so on an individual basis, um, it, it doesn't matter whether your mortgage um, fits the, the LTI right. guidelines or not. It's just that in the back end, they're going to look at an aggregate of all of the bank's mortgages to make sure that overall they're not exceeding this for uh, 4.5 times. Um, in so in this in this scenario, could I get 500000 for the or yeah, would in, in limited to the 450? Because I was reading yeah. somewhere that they said you can no longer even count the second mortgage or a HELOC and all that, or has that not changed? Yeah, so this is, um, that's a kind of a separate issue. So on, on your mortgage, if you do qualify, they could still give you a $500,000 mortgage in your mortgage. But in the back end, the banks are gonna be held accountable to ensure that they can't have more than a certain percentage of their portfolio, more than 25% of their portfolio be over that 450% ratio. So okay. they couldn't give you, Aussie that mortgage and uh, a ton of other people I uh, couldn't give more than 25 other Aussies out of that batch of 100 people a mortgage where that uh, they're exceeding that 40 percent yeah interesting because they are the, the the office of this one the office they also made the rule I guess that the reserves have to be increased from three percent to three and a half percent which yeah. means the banks will have a little less money to lend out yes and that's there'll right. probably be more competition for mortgage money or more competition for paying better rate on GICs? Well, yeah, what will end up happening is um, it's going to affect the balancing in the back end. And we've actually seen this with a couple of different banks, like uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, Scotiabank actually had a bit of a balance sheet issue where um, in order to rebalance things, they had too many mortgages on the books compared to the assets that they had to try to make sure that they're getting in line with these new capital uh, ratios. Um, and so they actually made their mortgages less competitive to lower their mortgage book mm -hmm. and to try to focus more on bringing more assets in the door 
um, in order to uh, to make sure that their their books are balanced. And so this effect, if anything, it'll actually not make mortgages more competitive, make them less competitive because the cost of funding a mortgage will be more expensive. If a bank has to have more money sitting in the vault, earning them no interest right. per mortgage at the door, then that actually makes the mortgages more expensive, not less expensive. Yeah, I was uh, talking to some friends of mine who felt that uh, they would actually now become more competitive attracting capital because they're going to have somewhat less. They would, so they need to uh, get more capital in the door. And that's why they would maybe offer a slightly higher interest rate or it would be more competitive anyways in terms of what they pay on a GIC. Yes, I don't know. Right. It's, it's they, yeah, to bring in the money they would. Yeah. To fund and push out mortgages, no, it would be no. more expensive. But Just to have yeah. more, not only more money to lend out for other things, but they would probably yeah. have to look. I mean, so how are borrowers really affected then? Yeah, so it, it won't change a lot. Like a, a typical borrower won't see a massive change or or or, um, or a, a decline because they're exceeding this 450% ratio. But what you may find is that banks may all of a sudden start to just pull back slightly on their policies. So we do find in general, um, and, and especially... Uh, for rental property mortgages or other things where they have to balance the back end books. Now you'll see lenders that will sometimes shift their policies and either shift rates or shift the, their uh, qualifications on rental products or other products because they'll say, oh, we have too many of the rental products on our books. We have to now mm -hmm. decrease that. So you're going to find another thing where maybe the lenders just start to just tweak the, the needle a little bit and say, you know what, we have too many of these types of mortgages. We're going to just do a little bit of a pullback. And one thing I think you might find find is that a lot of banks lately have been making debt servicing exceptions so usually they want to go to about 48 percent of your income as your as your maximum total total, total yeah. yeah total debt servicing they call it um a lot of the banks lately have been going to 48 or even 50 percent on a lot of applications so i think that that's where you're going to see that exception bandwidth and range might start to just compress if they need to. And then, okay, we're under well underneath the bar, we can expand it a little bit. So you'll just see a little bit of compression expansion within the exception range, I would say. All the more reason that you need a mortgage broker. I mean, maybe, you know, this bank, you know, don't go there because uh, their rules force them to be less, you know, less uh, fly pliable to, to grant a loan, but this one, maybe they have some room and it's a better chance. That's that's why you want a professional in there. What about investors? Just a strict real estate investor, yeah. how are they affected? Yeah, so the, the one of the things that we were initially worried about is that was the loan to income ratio going to be all loans or is it just going to be the subject loan, just the loan that the borrower is getting on that mortgage? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a way, there was a lot of concern that, OK, if we have to look at the entire portfolio, and all, all mortgage debt compared to their income, that would throw the loan to income ratio well out of whack and would severely affect uh, uh, investors. But we did get confirmation that that is not going to be the case. and It's going to be on a per mortgage basis. And in fact, based on that, an investor's mortgage is actually likely to be well underneath the 450%. Because if you're getting a mortgage on a rental property, you usually have your own personal mortgage or whatnot on your residence. Usually you're not even getting close to 450% um, of your income on the loan on the rental because you need enough debt servicing and borrowing power to be able to qualify mm -hmm. uh, to carry your own personal residence and other, other debts. So it shouldn't affect investors a whole lot, which is good. But still, you know, before you sign on the dotted line, make sure you sit down with some expert to sort of explain to you what the rules are for you personally. You know, what's the balance of your portfolio? I'm always amazed. We are right now closing 40 odd units in an apartment building that our real estate company sold, I guess, uh, I guess now three years ago. And, you know, right up till what, months before people are running around looking for a mortgage. I mean, where were you? You know, when you had all this time, you know, particularly with somebody like you, you, you were able to get a four months rent guarantee. So why would you wait till the last minute? And then they're always surprised. Well, the government is, of course, is worried and obviously is worried. And I would think that on balance, these all these rules on reserves, if they're going to bring it in, it's good to bring it now. Because as you point out, absolute great point that when rates go down, you can with the same ratio, you can earn, uh, if you didn't have the ratio, you can get a lot more mortgage. You know, if, if uh, maybe right now I'm limited uh, to get 450,000, maybe in the future, I would be with lower rates, say at 3%, I 
I would get 550,000. Well, that would be stopped. So what they're, they're almost putting a break in now when nobody really is affected, but could be affected as rates go down, which would indicate to me and maybe you that the rates will definitely come down because they expect it to happen and they're preparing themselves for it. Yeah. What about the new 30-year amortization that we all talk, talk about? Who is it? Yeah, so yeah, it's coming out and it's for uh, for new um, for new properties and it's for first-time buyers. Um, and it's interesting because I was just at a conference, um, a mortgage conference Monday and Tuesday, and I was asking the lenders, how will you determine whether the borrower and buyer is a first-time buyer or not? Um, because typically that's something that's done at the legal stage and you're signing in front of the notary or lawyer, but that's well after you get the approval. So I still don't know exactly how the lenders are going to verify the information to confirm that a buyer or borrower is a first-time buyer before they get an approval for a 30-year amortization. The hope or, or thought process here is that they may also potentially open it up to 30-year amortization just if you're buying your own personal residence and you don't currently own a home. That may be an easy way of, of doing it, but we're not sure yet. Um, the impact to a, a, a buyer now, if you're trying to get into the market and buy your first home, the, the extension of going 30 year amortization instead of 25 is that you qualify for about 5% more home. So it will bump up your borrowing power a little bit, but it's not going to make a huge difference. If you could maximum qualify for $500,000 before, now you'd be able to qualify for about 525. So it's a little bit of a nudge up, um, won't make a huge impact on your, on your borrowing power, but, uh, but for some buyers, they're right on the cusp and it will help them a little bit, especially with their payments. Well, we got a lot of uh, people thinking that they're renewing their mortgage and then they would renew it for 30 years. Well, technically, what they're talking about is a new mortgage on a new construction and uh, and uh, maybe first time buyers. So, so the whole idea is that that doesn't really affect me uh, getting a better mortgage payment, doesn't it? I mean, no, like, not really. There's a 30 year mortgage available now if you have. If you don't have an insured mortgage, you could have gotten a 30-year mortgage all along. Correct. Yeah, so this more it's only going to affect those people that were putting less than 20% down where the maximum that you could get for an insured mortgage was 25 years. And now if you're a first-time buyer buying brand new, it would go up to 30 years. So, so I think if, you're, small, yeah, you know, if you're all about $100,000, it might make a $50 difference. So if it's a $500,000 mortgage, you can save maybe $250 on the payment. Yep. Maybe it'll help you, but I don't know that it's going to make that much of a difference. Nope. And uh, like most things, Ozzy, I feel like this is just one of those little political things that get the dangle that has such a small impact on the market. Helping you, we're great. helping you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're exactly. out there. We're doing everything we can for affordability. In the meantime, let's add more taxes, and thirty-three percent of the cost of the new property is actually all government services and permits and whatnot. So yeah. the difference that it will make in borrowing power. About five percent, not a huge difference. Yeah, not really that nice. specific situation too. So, so will that change our market dramatically? Not really. No, I mean some some things sometimes have an effect where it's buyer sentiment, and if you affect buyer sentiment, then you can affect the marketplace, right? So there may be um, certain hope first time buyers who think, oh, maybe now I can get, finally afford it, and now maybe I can get in, but. In my opinion, what will actually affect buyer sentiment a lot more, especially for first-time buyers, is going to be the Bank of Canada dropping the rates for the first time. And right now, it seems like the the markets are pricing in about a 50% chance of a quarter point decrease in June. And if that doesn't happen in June, then close to 100% chance it happens in July. And not to say that that means there's a 100% chance, but it just means that that's the people that are betting on it are making that assumption. And I think that that will be a bit of a spur for those first-time buyers, especially that are sitting in the sidelines to say, maybe now is a good time to get in. Well, it's the psychology, you know, the psychology. I mean, I mean, spring 2023, the buyers all of a sudden got nuts. The psychology was they were acting as if the rates had already gone down. Yeah, yeah. In that anticipation and the market took off. And when you look at this, this year's March in Toronto, the March um, sales, are at lo the lowest since 2009. So, you know, you know, it is a dramatic change in actually fewer sales this year. And our March, uh, again, we were about between five and 7% behind, but we're 30% below the 10 year average. And, you know, we had 600 odd sales in Vancouver 
But two years ago, we had 1,200, and three years ago, we had 1,900 cells. So we are, you know, we are we're better than we were. Maybe the market is stabilizing and so on, but it isn't hotter than firecrackers out there. And yes, we're all waiting for the interest rates. And today, the U.S. went back over 7% for their 30-year loans. You know, yeah. so you, you have, an, and as long as the, the 10-year rate is now, yesterday was at 4.7%. Well, that affects all tax fixed rates, certainly in the United States. And we're not that far behind, you know. So yeah. interest rates are a mug's game. If you really want to have a not-so-fun afternoon in front of a YouTube channel and find out the brainiest top people in the world, they're, they're Jamie Dimon who run billions and billions of dollars of the funds. Well, he thinks it's going to go 7%. Then Bill Ackman, another billion, billion, billion guy, the people person, he thinks 4% is much more likely. So you and I look at that. They look at the same facts, probably have more facts, and come up with opposite conclusions. So for the average person, it's really a, it's a mugs game. In any case, I will still ask her for your predictions. Yeah, great. The crystal ball, <laughs> she's not working anymore, Ozzy. I don't know what to say, but um, I'll pull up what people that are betting on the, what the Bank of Canada and what the uh, where things are going to head, because if they're putting their money where their mouth is, then I'll rely on that information. But the general consensus is that right now the Bank of Canada will decrease between two to three times this year. And that pendulum, by the way, has swung. So back in January, it was four or even five decreases wow. by the end of the year. Um, and then now recently it's moved down to about two and a half. My prediction then based on that pendulum swinging where it most likely sits is maybe three quarters of a percent, maybe as much as 1%, mm -hmm. maybe as little as a half a percent. I think it's somewhere in yeah. that in that range. Um, and it's important for people to know too that fixed rates um, are are kind of correlated with the Bank of Canada, but not. And so the bond market, which is how fixed rates are determined, has already built in and has a caked in estimate of what's going to happen with the Bank of Canada. So people assume that if the um, if the Bank of Canada decreases interest rates, that then the bond market will react and therefore fixed rates will drop. But actually, the bond market will only react if the Bank of Canada moves out of step with the expectations. And so you're going to find that as of right now, the bond market is already assuming, you know, anywhere from a half to 1% decrease in the in the uh, Bank of Canada rate this year. And so it's only if we decrease more or less than that number, that we're going to see bond markets go up or go down and fixed rates move, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in lockstep. So I don't actually see and foresee a lot of decreases to the fixed rate side of things. That's already been kind of built into the equation. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I presented on the um, on Monday and Tuesday at the conference is I had a presentation about should brokers be recommending fixed or variable to the clients? And we ran a, I have a spreadsheet. You know, I love spreadsheets, Aussie. Um, <laughs> you make the best spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and one of those spreadsheets that I've been uh, using a lot lately is we look at what the Bank of Canada's updates are. We update it probably every month or so. And we then put in the expectations what the Bank of Canada is going to do for the next couple of years. And then we are able to run an analysis on variable versus fixed. And back in December, January, it was looking heavily skewed towards variable. Like you should take a variable based off of that. And now the pendulum has swung. And depending on the circumstances, it's either slightly variable or maybe a little bit more edgy, edgy towards variable. But in that case, if it's close to 50-50 or slightly better variable, a lot of people just aren't willing to take the risk and they're willing to just, let's just take a three-year fixed rate and not have to think about it. Um, it's hard to say though, the closer we get to the Bank of Canada actually starting to move down rates, the, the more that a variable looks attractive. It's just, are people going to be okay with the fact that it might not come to fruition? And oh, that's might, that's the might. crazy thing, you know, you have all these reasons, I mean, uh, the, the, the enormous debts that Canada has. I mean, we have now uh, all the all the interest that we pay on the incredible debt that was inc uh, incurred and increased. I mean, we double the debt now than we were before when Mr. Trudeau was elected. So we have double the debt. The payments on that debt are now higher than our, what we take in on GST. No, no difference in the U.S. where the payments are higher than all of the, the cost of the military. Can you think about it? We're looking at billions and billions of dollars. So now the, the other thing you look at our Tiff Macklin, our banker, and then we have our finance minister. And they're, they're, when they don't dance together, 
you know, they have that thing, that fight. What is she going to do in terms of spending? Because the more the government spends, the harder it is to get inflation to get down, the harder is Tiff Macklin's job. And then they look at the United States. Can they go ahead of the United States or do they have to be with the United States? I mean, you can get gray hairs to just uh, find that out. And for the average buyer, the saying is going to go up or down. We put in our Ausbus newsletter last year that uh, we felt the first cut would be June. Not, I mean, we had. Porto of the Bank of Montreal, we had uh, Benjamin Tall, we had uh, uh, our Perma Bear, David Rosenberg, they all were predicting first cut would be April, and that we would make five cuts, as you pointed out, in the United States, or six or seven cuts, you know, now the pendulum has swung, so anybody that banked on what everybody was saying didn't happen, and so I, I think that for the go our government, we have unemployment is rising. We have layoffs are increasing. Our retail sector isn't that great. Our unemployment rate is rising. Whereas the US has 300,000 new jobs, we have uh, unemployment at an all time low, historic all time low. You have all of that. So we have two totally different economic pressures. And so for a banker now, our central banker, he's got to think. What are we going to do, right? Yeah. It's going to reduce by the government wants lower interest rates too, but the costs of the interest is so vast, right? So we're in un uncharted waters, no doubt about it. But the five-year term, the fixed rate went as low as 4.79, 4.99 the last time we talked, and you, there was a good time to maybe lock that in. What is the best rate now? Yeah, you can you can actually still get for five year terms. There's a few lenders that are still offering four point seven four percent as of today. If it's uh, if it fits a certain box, so that's an insured mortgage or an insurable mortgage, which I want to get into detail and bore everybody here. But there are classifications where you could get a, a five year rate that low. Uh, three year rates are in the low uh, low fives for the best uh, best three year rates. Most banks are in the mid fives for a three year fix. There's a few that are in the low fives. Um, and then variable rates right now are anywhere from prime minus about a half a percent to prime minus one, depending on the, the qualification. So that would put you into the low to mid sixes for variable. So there's still a pretty big gap between variable and, and fixed. And so you have to assume and, and uh, hope, I suppose, going variable that the rates do come down enough. And um, technically, it's it's showing that it would, it, you know, if what uh, predictions people have currently actually comes to fruition, then variable would slightly outperform fixed, but I don't know if people are willing to take that gamble today. And so uh, that's where well, it's, it's, it's really to terrible to, that people have to take that gamble. All they want to do is buy a house. You know, I mean, we're not, we, we're not economists in that sense. And we're not predicting the economy. We, we don't know what government is going to do. We know that government needs always more money that has to come from us as well. Right. And yeah. so what are we, what are we going to do? But I do think one of the things that everybody should do is sit down with somebody like yourself or people in your office that can at least outline all the options. And then you can make an informed, intelligent decision because that's what we need. So we, the prediction of the mortgage markets, we know your interest rates. What do you think that the, real, the general real estate market is going to do this year? Yeah, it's interesting. I've been watching and uh, and following some of the um, predictions that have been coming out from RBC, CMHC, et cetera. And a, a lot of the major banks are predicting that the market's flat for the first half of the year and then starting to uptick in the in the last half of the year, with probably uh, correlating with interest rates starting to drop. I think that that's effectively what they're suggesting. Um, interestingly, um, CMHC and a few others are predicting you know, mid to high single digit rises in values in 2025 by the end of 2025. And so it's starting to indicate that 2025 is likely to be a bit of a boom year in uh, in real estate. So um, I, I don't uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that. We've seen in the past that uh, that the market is very, um, very tight to interest rates. They're very sensitive to interest rates, affordability, uh, market sentiment, et cetera. Um, and I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But um, but the the predictions for values uh, going up that much, especially from some more like CMHC, who's historically quite conservative with their predictions, um, to see them get a, a pretty high uh, high number was uh, a bit surprising to me. Well, yeah, I, I guess Roy LePage came out and said average price is going to be up nine percent by the end of this year. So. Yeah. Um, but and in addition to that, we have $150 billion worth of mortgage renewals this year and $325 or so billion dollars next year that would come all into the mix. And maybe that would produce, if rates were down, maybe that would, would produce some more people wanting to sell or, you know, it's difficult to say, but 
again, predictions are, you know, also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're also a mug's game, you know. You, yeah. you. Know, I look. I try to look in the newsletter. I read a lot. I, I put out my blog, and then it, sometimes I sit there and I think, my God, you know, really, you know, how can how can anybody you know? I was watching Ray Dalio, who has his own following, and he looks at the history and he goes back to the 30s and the 40s and he finds comparisons and this and that. And then based on that, I mean, they run multi-billion-dollar funds, so they are there. And and in the end, they really doesn't know. You know, there's there's international influences and local influence, and then there's people are fighting, and you know, you have all of these kind of things going on. And all we want to know is, can we get a lower rate? <laughs> you know, can we get a more? That's all. <laughs> that's, we right, <laughs> <laughs> that's all we want to do. So, yeah, anyways, exactly. an interesting an interesting world um, that we live in. So, thank you very much for yes. taking the time. I know how busy you are because that's one thing we talked before the show that you uh, you were saying that things are getting better. No? Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely busier than 2023. I think talking to a lot of brokers have been around the block for quite some time. Um, 2023 was one of the biggest challenge, like a most challenging year for a lot of brokers, and so it's uh, 2024. Uh, although you mentioned that the sales data isn't quite there yet, it still seems like. 2024 is a recovery year. It is busier than uh, than we were last year for sure, and I think that it's more likely to continue moving forward. Whereas last spring, we had a very short two yeah. months. It was really hot, and then it just petered off. And I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's going to be slower and steadier, but uh, but swinging upwards throughout the year. And so, I'm feeling more optimistic for the first time in two years uh, as a broker um, about where the real estate market is heading. And uh, and it's been a while since a lot of us have felt that optimism, so it's uh, it's good. Yeah, I made a speech yesterday to the Real Estate Institute of Canada uh, annual meeting here in Vancouver, and I, I had all the all the details in terms of what's coming to the market. I mean, our developer side now, man, are they ever going into the pre-sale market with you know mm -hmm. fighting? You know, we have two thousand units in Langley, four thousand in Surrey, and we are launching and on the North Shore now. Uh, just because we have a lot of registrations and some of those those uh, developers get two, three, four thousand registrations, it doesn't always translate into an actual deal. But certainly, uh, they either really want to take advantage of this particular area, or there are more people looking. Unfortunately, we'll only know the numbers afterwards. You know, so so at least uh, the sun is shining. We're all still very much interested in real estate, and I hope you're right that we're going to have at least a half a percent lower rates by the end of the year. Thank you very much, uh, Carl. Thanks, Ozzy. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah, bye.